Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cash Committee for giving me the opportunity today to talk about our research project that has just completed and funded by Diabetes UK around diabetes education for adults with learning disability. So, just to um, maybe uh, inform what, what a learning disability is, or if it's outside of the UK, an intellectual disability. A learning disability is to do with the difficulty about learning based upon IQ, approximately around about 70. There's also difficulty in uh, social functioning. Varying, there are varying levels of intellectual disability in relation to mild, moderate, severe, profound. And we also know that people with learning disabilities are also a very hard group to identify and recruit for, for, for research projects as well. So a little bit of background on the mortality of people with intellectual disabilities. The, the people with intellectual disabilities or learning disability die on average 20 years younger than people without learning disabilities. And the three leading causes of death are respiratory disease, coronary heart disease and specific cancers. These are to do with stomach, gallbladder and esophageal cancer. And as well as having three leading causes of death, there are a range of, uh, a, range of a number of secondary or chronic long-term health conditions, as you can see a, a number of them on the board. But primarily the one that I'm here to speak about today is around diabetes. And there seems to be a higher prevalence rate of diabetes in this population. But as you can see on, on the diagram on the board, people with learning disabilities have complex health comorbidities alongside their learning disability and communication problems, which makes this uh, population difficult to, to look after for primary and secondary health care providers. So what, what do we know about the prevalence of, of learning disability? Well, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the general population the, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the general population is around about 5%. And in a number of studies around the world, the diabetes prevalence rates, uh, for example, in the study by Evans in Holland, they found a 17% prevalence rate. In England, they said it was five-fold. And in Canada, looking at administrative data sets, they found a four to five times higher prevalence rate. Uh, we, we undertook a study in Northern Ireland uh, and we found that 62%, 67% of people with learning disabilities had type 2 diabetes and 32% and had type 1 diabetes. And surprisingly we found that 23% of people with Down syndrome had type 1. And in a recent study, when you actually go proactively screening for diabetes, as in uh, Mary McCarran in Dublin, they found 11% prevalence rate. And there's been two systematic uh, reviews. And again, you need to think about, are people proactively screening for diabetes? How do we identify people with learning disabilities? And it's about getting a diagnosis. So they reckon around it's about maybe about 8 to 11 percent. We're still struggling. But why, why do people with learning disabilities have higher rates, of pre higher rates of diabetes? First of all, there may be a genetic component. So for example, people with Down syndrome, people with prader willi syndrome. There's also been some research around, around people with autistic spectrum disorder, that they are more likely to have diabetes. There may be also factors to do with uh, lifestyle. For example, we know people with learning disabilities have higher levels of sedentary behaviour, low levels of physical activity. They're also on um, more amounts of medication, particularly around antipsychotic medication. And all those factors lead to obesity. And if you think about the, this antipsychotic medication, this leads to the abdominal fat, and that's one of the things that leads to, to diabetes. And a recent population, a recent population-based cross-section analysis study further added weight that multi-morbidities in this population, including diabetes, are more common in adults with learning disability and occur at an earlier age, thereby making the management of this chronic, chronic condition uh, more difficult. What do we know about the impact? Uh, a number of studies has identified that people with learning disabilities have misunderstandings of actually what it is to have diabetes. They, they, don't, know the, they don't know much about the cause. 
They don't know much about the anatomy and physiology of diabetes. They don't understand about the complications and the signs of hypoglycemia and also about the lifestyle management strategies. Therefore, they have a greater dependency upon curers. These would be family curers and paid curers. Again, many of them may not be, be trained or understanding diabetes. And again, uh, uh, a study done in England looking at four adults with learning disability using IPA. They found that the participants, that the participants' knowledge of the language surrounding diabetes, they were very confused and uncertain. And the impact of diabetes described in terms of physical, emotional and social consequences spoke of diabetes in the coexisting uh, conditions of other conditions and not specifically related to the diabetes. And again, there's been recent research in Canada and they have found that you're more likely to be hospitalised because of your diabetes than people in the general population who have diabetes as well. <coughs> And what do we know about the management of it? Diabetes UK interviewed 38 people with learning disabilities and healthcare professionals and staff, and they found that there was a lack of appropriate information on what is diabetes and self-management. There was poor healthcare for, uh, for people with, with learning disabilities who had diabetes in the community, and overall the diagnosis was poor compared to people without a learning disability. We undertook a study in Northern Ireland in 2013 and we found that there was poor glycemic control. Uh, and again, you were, more, you, were worse, you were more likely to have poor glycemic control if you had type 1 diabetes, you were younger and you lived with parents or independently. Results of these studies also show that people with learning disabilities are not meeting the good standards recognised by, by uh, the good management guidelines, particularly identified by Diabetes UK. There are 15 good quality indicators, and many people with learning disabilities and diabetes aren't meet, meet, meeting those. And one of the, the biggest things that's recommended by the government is, if you've got type 2 diabetes, is that you go along to a structured self-management program. And we have found, and many, many studies have found across the world, that people with learning disabilities are not offered structured diabetes education, which has been found to help so again, it's not, really, not routinely offered to this population, even though it's identified as best practice by the NICE guidelines in 2003-2011. Uh, and there seems to be a greater need for diabetes education for this population because they're not getting it from any other source. In the UK, if you or I were to develop type 2 diabetes, we would be encouraged to go onto a programme called Desmond. If you had type 1 diabetes, you would be encouraged to go on Daphne. These are national programmes funded by the, the National Health Service. However, this structured education programme uh, that has been developed to improve the biomedical, psychosocial and self-management strategies for the general population is not routinely, routinely offered to this population. So this is what this, this study is about. So if you don't understand, if you don't know what Desmond is, Desmond stands for Diabetes Education and self-management for ongoing and newly diagnosed. There are four current, or more simply, it's a way of finding out more about type 2 diabetes. It's a resource to help you to manage the changes diabetes will bring to your life. It's an opportunity to meet and share your experiences with others with diabetes. And it is a family of modules. At the minute, there are four modules that are, advertised, or that are delivered across the, the UK. There is the Desmond Newly Diagnosed, the Desmond Foundation for those who already have established diabetes, there is Desmond for, um, for, for people with other languages, and then there's Walking Away. For those who are at risk of Desmond, there is a dab Walking Away. And then, hopefully, with the study that we're, we're doing, there will be a new module called Desmond ID, Desmond Intellectual Disability. We weren't very creative with our name. So what is Desmond? Desmond is a psychologically and educational theoretically underpinned programme. It has clear principles of philosophy. It is content and proven theoretically driven. It is six hours of education with a structured curriculum. It can either be delivered for one day or two half days. There are two health to uh, diabetes educators. They could be 
and a professional are lay. They normally take about eight to ten people in a group, and you can bring a supporting uh, a relative or a spouse. Normally, in the primary care fa- fa- uh, premises, um, there is materials and there is quality assured. That is the Desmond program that's currently being delivered across the UK as we speak and within Northern Ireland. Just to let you know that there are certain difficulties as we had to identify before adapting Desmond. The first is we need to think about what does it actually mean to have a learning disability and the level of learning disability and cognitive deficits that go with that in relation to processing information, recall, reappraisals of beliefs and behaviours. We also have to think about the levels of literacy skills and how do we adapt a structured programme to people who would have minimal literacy skills and about the different learning skills for how this population learn. And we also need to think about engagement with family carers and paid support, paid supporters, because this was crucial in how we were going to deliver the programme. And then again, we need to think about the variation in supports as well and that, uh, in relation to how does a person cook a meal? Do they cook a meal? Who buys the food? And again, we had to think very carefully about that. So this is what this project was. This project, funded by Diabetes UK, was to take Desmond and to adapt it for people with learning disabilities. So we took Desmond, we took it to Ulster University, we looked at the programme, and then we, and that was some of the researchers, myself and Maria Truesdale, and then some clinical staff, we took Desmond and we adapted it the way we thought it should be adapted. And then we had two iterations, sorry, two iterations. The first time we delivered to seven people with learning disabilities and type 2 diabetes, and we delivered it over six weeks. And each person got £20 for coming along. They spent a day at the university. We delivered the broken down version of Desmond. We videotaped it and then we did focus groups. Uh, And that's that's how it happened there. So it was over six weeks, two and a half hours. And then we added an extra week for curves. So the first week was for for family and paid curves to come along to understand what is type 2 diabetes, what is the Desmond version, and then how can they support and again, we had different people reviewing it. So the, the people with learning disabilities were offered opportunities to engage in focus groups, likewise for family cares. And then we had three independent observers who observed the interactions of the people with learning disabilities and the educators. And then we developed the Desmond ID. And the plan is to train one learning disability nurse and one diabetic specialist nurse. They would have specific training and then they would go and deliver it. So just some details about what Desmond would look like. So we need to think about the time. So again, the current Desmond programme, the national programme is eight hours. Ours is now a 21-hour programme. We need to think about the core concepts. Even though they were still based upon the core concepts within Desmond, the national programme, we just simplified them. For example, when Desmond looks at fats, is it important that a person with learning disability understands what good cholesterol is and bad cholesterol? Is it important for how, you, how, you, how we break down uh, sugar, uh, sugar uh, glucose and how that works in the body? We need to think very carefully about breaking those concepts down and what a person with learning disability actually needed to know. Then we need to think about uh, how we represented the core concepts, the aims and objectives, and how we broke it down. And we very much use pictorial representations, visual aids, photographs, pictures and symbols. And we made sure that when we we developed those, we always presented them to the people with learning disability. And then they agreed that just this was the right picture and the right term to use. And we used those through all the six sessions. So, for example, you can see here, uh, what we normally do is we get a bit of uh, paper, a long bit of paper, and we get a person to lie down and we draw, they get to draw, one of the people gets to draw around them. And then they have pictures, and then they get to stick them on. They learn a little bit about the anatomy of the body. Then we try and explain again about how, when you take food, and what happens in in that process. And again, in relation to some of the core concepts, like blood sugar, blood fat, blood pressure, feeling sad, I can't see that, body shape, and smoking. Again, we use the same pictures each week, and we build upon that. That was very, very important for for repetitious learning. And like I'm saying to you, all the sessions were interactive. All the sessions were interactive, so there was lots of movement and getting up. 
Um, there was always about the whole issue about developing the person's skills to make decisions in relation to what activities they were going to do or, or what foods they were going to pick. It was all about, again, increasing the person's self-efficacy that they can engage. And again, we needed to get the support of the carers. That was important. And then each week, there was a health action plan based upon either one activity of self-management and the person, the, 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 the carer and the person with learning disability had to buy into that and make a plan for the week. And they came back the following week and then they talked about how successful was that. And then um, the most important thing was to have celebration and fun. And, and it was good crack, I have to say, throughout those two iterations of it, it was very, very good fun. The second iteration was actually carried out in a day centre for people with learning disability. So this is the, the, the curriculum broken down to the six weeks. As you can see, we're, we're, we're aiming for about 21 hours here. Uh, and this is the difference. And this is the exact same curriculum as the National Desmond Programme. So we haven't changed it. It's the exact same program. So we're talking about what is their story? What is it? What is their story? How did they develop diabetes? Do they know the risk factors? What about the complications? What is diabetes? And what I did, and you can see these sessions, it was the same session every week along here. So it was lots of repetitious learning and callback. Uh, my story with diabetes, part two, food and blood, um, knowing what your blood sugar levels mean, being active, uh, what I learned today, the heart and circulatory, other diabetes problems, making healthier food choices, food fats, and then about the health action plan. So we did that, that took about a, a, a year, and then we moved into a pilot feasibility study. So we actually got funded for that as well in, in the same study. So we actually wanted to know, is it possible to deliver Desmond, the intellectual disability version, and, and also look at could we run a mini randomised control trial. So, and this took place in Northern Ireland, basically Antrim, Cardiff and Edinburgh. There was, we, we were able to identify 66 adults who met our criterion, and of those 66 adults who met our criterion, 39 agreed to participate in our mini randomised control trial. 20 were randomised to the control group and 19 were measured to the, were, were randomised to the in, intervention group. Um, everybody had baseline measurements, so there was bloods taken for HB1AC, we had BMI taken, and then we also uh, asked the, 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 the participants to complete some skills around their perceptions and severity of diabetes and their quality of life and some and how they self-manage, some of the self-management strategies. So that was taken, and then people were randomised by our statistician, and then, they, uh, and then we trained, before that, sorry, I should have said we trained six, six nurses uh, over the three countries, and they delivered the programme. So it, it was delivered for seven weeks, so the first week was for family carers only, and then for the following six weeks, the family carers or paid carers and the people with learning disabilities came along to the programme. In relation to the fe feasibility aspect to it, uh, we had very good attendance rates. Uh, like I'm saying, over half of the population, 10 of the participants attended all the sessions and the remainder attended four of the five. That was quite good attendance. Likewise, um, we know the reasons for, it with, for dropout and again, the attendance from family cares was very important. One of the interesting findings, particularly in Scotland, was that some of the cares who we thought would be family or paid was actually a spouse or a partner but they also had a learning disability as well. So that, that was something we, we knew in that study. And in relation to the, the, the measurements pre-post, so we had baseline, seven-week intervention, and then three months after the intervention, we, we followed the, 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 the measurements up again. And as you can see, at baseline, the HbA1c was 67, and for the intervention group, that decreased to 57. This study was not powered. And likewise, for the control group, it actually increased from 61 to HPA EC1 of 65. We did some, we look at the interaction effect, and that actually what we found was that it was statistically significant at the 0.1 level. Now I know people would argue, oh you should only take 0.05, but this was not, this was not statistically powered. So we, we think this is very promising. Uh, and we're at the stage now of going forward 
for a, a full randomized control trial applying to the NIH, NIHR. So we're hoping that this study, and particularly if we move into the randomized control trial and show that it works, uh, we're hoping that this study would show that, uh, that Desmond ID would provide better management and control of the person's uh, diabetes and would bring uh, improved health for this population. It would also bring improved quality of life for the person with learning disability and their diabetes as we would have better uh, blood glucose control. It should lead to a reduction in uh, emergency hospital admissions and also we hope that it will reduce a burden on healthcare costs. So just, just to finish off, we have some challenges uh, in, in, in this field of learning disability and particularly within the field of, 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 of di diabetes. The first is how do we identify and screen for people with learning disabilities who, who have intellectual disability. Uh, it, it's, it's estimated that about 1% of the population should have a learning disability, but when you look at GP records, particularly in Northern Ireland, we just have a prevalence rate of 0.4%. So there are a lot of people with learning disability who may not even have a diagnosis or it's not even recorded on the GP re register, so that's maybe difficult to get. And there are a group of people, there's quite a considerable amount of people, maybe half of people with learning disability, who, who don't want to be recognised or invisible. So that's interesting. The next thing we need to think about, how do we prevent? Because type 2 diabetes is one of those conditions that can be prevented. So again, we need to think about educating people uh, around diet and nutrition, we need to prevent people from leading sedentary lifestyles uh, and be more physically active. And again, we maybe need to look at how we medicate people with learning disabilities for their mental health or their behaviour. And hopefully then that will decrease our obesity levels as well. And then therefore, um, we should take people out of that risk category. But those who are at the risk category, we should really be identifying them very quick. And in all in Ireland, that should be easy because we have health checks. So we can identify this population quickly. Again, whose responsibility is it? Is it the learning disability staff to look after people with diabetes who have a learning disability? Or is it the primary care team who run di diabetes management clinics? You know, this is a difficult question because at the minute, for most people who have a learning disability, the primary health care system say, well, if you've got a learning disability, you should be seen by learning disability services. But we can't see everybody. We're just a learning disability team. Uh, who specialise in the field of learning disability, but we need to work with our partners in primary health care. And one of those areas we could be better working with is the whole area of diabetes and then this better coordination between learning disability services and diabetes. And then lastly, and my last point for today, is to actually look about creating opportunities uh, for people with learning disabilities to actively engage in diabetes prevention, screening, education and, and self-management. Thank, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.